Hello, powerful people, and welcome back to the Power at Work blog. My name is Seth Harris. I'm a senior fellow at the Burns Center for Social Change. Uh, you know, one of the biggest topics of conversation in labor circles right now is how will generative AI affect jobs and worker power? Now, on this blogcast, we're going to give you access to a presentation by two experts from the International Labor Organization, whose research helps to answer that big question. These researchers looked into the potential global exposure of various jobs to generative AI, particularly GPT-4, and they reached a conclusion that I think might surprise you. So you did the right thing by joining this blogcast to learn more about workers, jobs, and generative AI. You know what, though, before we get to that conversation, I want you to know that the Power at Work blog is a proud member of the Labor Radio Podcast Network. The Labor Radio Podcast Network connects over 100 radio shows and podcasts all over the country. To learn more about the network or to find other fantastic labor radio shows and podcasts, please visit www.laborradionetwork.com. Org. And if you want to listen to or download any or all of the Power at Work blog casts in podcast form, they're available for streaming and download on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Overcast. Just search Power at Work on any commercial podcast platform. You're going to find us there. And let me just say, when you find us, We'd really appreciate it if you give us a five-star rating. It doesn't just make us feel good. It actually helps other people like you to find our content. They will appreciate it. And as I said, we will really appreciate it. All right, you all. So we're going to do something a little bit different today on the Power at Work blog. Usually when you tune in for a Power at Work blogcast, you see a discussion between me and a labor leader or a roundtable uh, in which I talk with some academics or some journalists, or I have a conversation with a union leader and some union members about what, what they're doing. And those were all a lot of fun for me, and I hope they're interesting and, and enlightening for you. Uh, and that's core to the Power at Work blog's mission, and that's to elevate the discourse about worker power, unions, and collective action by putting workers and workers' concerns right at the heart of that conversation. But another part of our mission is to lift up the great work that many, many others are doing to advance a worker-centered discourse in the United States. In other words, it's not all about us. And that's why we republish posts from other outlets. That's why we invite academics to write posts about their latest book or their latest article or, or their latest research study. It's why we promote other organizations' events. For example, we're involved with the DC Labor Film Fest, which is coming up in May. And we publish the weekly download. It's all important. It's all valuable. And it's all about providing you with great content about worker power, unions, collective action, and workers, regardless of its source. We're not the only ones who have something worthwhile to say here. We want you to see as much of it as we can get onto the blog. Now, in this blogcast, what we're going to do is to offer you video of an event that was sponsored by the International Labor Organization, an essential global organization advocating for worker rights, involving employers and governments in that conversation along with labor organization. It comes from a webinar that the ILO sponsored featuring two of its senior researchers, Janine Berg and Pavel Gamirik. And in the webinar, Berg and Gamirik describe their research on jobs and generative artificial intelligence, and they respond to questions from the in-person audience. Janine Berg is a senior economist and the head of the ILO's Effective Labor Institutions Unit. Since joining the ILO in 2002, she's conducted research on the economic and social effects of labor laws, as well as provided technical assistance to ILO constituents on policies for generating jobs and improving worker conditions. She's written a number of uh, books and articles on employment and labor market institutions and the digital transformation of work. 
Pavel Gamirik is a senior researcher in the ILO's Effective Labor Institutions Unit. He's been a staff member of the ILO since 2008 and publishes on topics related to multilateral funding, aid effectiveness, human rights and technology, and of course, jobs. Now, before we get started, I want to prepare you for what you're about to see, because it's very, very valuable, but it's going to look very different from our other blogcasts. This event was not planned to be a blogcast. It was planned to be a webinar. And so for those of you who participate uh, remotely in webinars, this is going to look familiar to you, but I know a lot of our audience doesn't do that. So there are three things you need to know about what you're going to see before you go in first. This is a video of a bunch of folks sitting around a table in a conference room listening to a presentation. In fact, I think there are a few people eating their lunch. <laughs> I think it's their lunch in uh, in the room uh, during the presentation. That's fine. Uh, Janine and Pavel are sitting on the camera side of the room, so you're not going to see their faces. So it's going to be it's going to be a little odd because you're going to sort of hear disembodied, seemingly disembodied voices. Um, and most of the time, the screen will be filled with a PowerPoint presentation that they offered to people so that they could follow the research and the way that they were talking about it. There's nothing wrong with any of that, but it's going to look quite different from what you're accustomed to seeing on a Power at Work broadcast. Second thing you need to know, the first 17 or 18 minutes of the presentation are pretty technical. As Pavel describes the methodology he and Janine used to conduct their study. It's, it's scholarly, but I think it's interesting, and it gives you the opportunity to see how really complicated and challenging it is to conduct a valid study uh, such that the results are really meaningful results. So bear with it. Um, it's, it. It is a scholar's presentation of a scholarly methodology, but it is very interesting, and I really want to encourage you to stick with it um, because I, the payoff is definitely going to be worth it, I promise. Finally, we left in the question and answer period. Obviously, you can't participate in the question and answer period because this, this webinar has already happened. Um, but we left in the question and answer part of the conversation because the questions were really good and the answers were extremely good. And a lot of what you're going to learn will come out of that, that Q&A period. It'll illuminate some of what was said in the presentation in chief. All right. Those are our guests. I've set the scene. You are our audience. Enjoy the conversation. So, thank you very much. Uh, so I will go through the first part of the presentation, which shows a little bit uh, sort of the method that we use to, to come to our conclusions and what we observe as the aggregate effects in terms of the global picture. And then Janine will receive uh, stem that's the working paper that we published last August on this topic and it's available online yes it has all the gory details we also have smaller uh, versions of it as a policy brief uh, that's available yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's a task-based approach to understanding the impact of technology on occupations. There are different strands in the literature that tries to understand how occupations interact uh, with technology. And there are, among those different methods, some people look more at abilities of technologies like AI and link them with occupations. Others look at the technology that gets patents and tries to understand, try to understand uh, how that might later influence jobs that is look at ads for example that are uh online scan those ads and try to see what kind of skills are being uh put into those ads to, to, to try to proxy the adoption of technologies and also how jobs evolve and another way of doing of looking at, at this is to look through the tasks as sort of task bundles around occupations so the things that we do in a given occupation every day that make a, a job at a given point in time. And these things evolve over time, as we know, so some tasks get maybe become more redundant or they, they automated, but new tasks often emerge and that often defines an occupation. 
but when many such tasks get uh, a very strong interaction with technology, that occupation might actually disappear. So that's what is here on the first picture on the left. These are switchboard operators that basically had these tasks that were central to their job. And when technologies appeared that could automate the majority of those tasks, the job eventually stopped existing. Then we have the bank tellers in the middle, which is a different story. Bank tellers used to deal a lot with banknotes. And uh, when ATM technology and connectivity uh, appeared, people were thinking, all well, these jobs will just disappear, just like switchboard operators did. And then that was shown in studies that that's not exactly what happened. In the 90s, actually, these two jobs grew. They just evolved. So while those routine tasks, like distributing banknotes, were automated, uh, it led to socialization and it led to development of other tasks among back to bank tellers that achieved that job grew in terms of the share of employment. And then we have these jobs like the two gentlemen on the right in the plane who pilot that machine and who we could probably do without them technically, just like it's possible to fly a drone without pilots, but that's not something that uh, people want to do. So there's like this very conscious decision to keep a human in command, even though in theory you could automate and work towards the automation of all those tasks, but that's not something that one wants to do. And there are many such occupations where that, that, that human oversight is key. So that's how we need to think about when we approach about it, when we approach the evolution of occupations when it comes into contact with any technology. And in this case, we're looking at generative AI. So technologies of like GPT-4 and similar language models, and we try to understand what they might be able to do with occupations. So our starting point is a system that we are actually the custodian of at the ALO, this International Standard Classification of Occupations, which is a hierarchical system with four levels. At the highest level, it has those 10 groups on the left. And at the most detailed level, there are 436 occupations that sort of link to that as a hierarchical structure. And it turns out that when the system was created, the international the statisticians that meet at the ALO to design and approve it, they also approve the technical documentation, which within that documentation, we find typical tasks for each occupation. So there are about 10 task groups that represent an occupation that was internationally agreed. So that's a great thing because that means we have 3,123 such tasks, which give us like a common denominator that we can use to understand the impact of technology across the countries around the world. Because we need this, this type of a common denominator to be able to do a global study. And what we did in this particular study, we also rely on the capacities of those large language models. Because they are trained on so much data that's available on those uh, occupational systems and classifications, they actually understand them very well. They're able to replicate them and even enhance the definition. So this is an example of a definition of a primary school teacher. The one on the left, a very short description, is the official description in the ESCO documentation. The one on the right is what we generated using the language model. And basically, throughout the study, the data generation is done through working with the API, the application programming uh, interface. So these are like huge loops that just talk directly to the model. It's not the way you would chat with ChatGPT, but we basically loop it, and it just runs for hours by getting call and response from, from the model. So we, we first generated all these definitions to see to what extent these models are able to represent the notion of occupations to understand in a way they understand it. And they do it quite well. They might even be able to help us enhance some of these definitions. So then we went to the task level. These are tasks for a primary school teacher, a selection of tasks. And you can see on the right, we generated tasks with the GPT-4, the same way I described. And they really kind of match the responsibilities. So you can see that these language models are able to like represent what the occupation is about in broad terms, and we, re we essentially rely on this capacity to go further. Uh, there have been some studies that came out last year where people also compared generation of data by these models with generation of data by asking AI experts about which tasks can get 
automated and they show very close proximity of opinions. So basically these models are able to predict the opinion of AI experts in terms of big picture of what type of work can be performed with this technology. So we rely on that finding and we loop the, that model over all three all 3,123 tasks and we generate scores. So a score is zero if that particular task cannot be automated at all with this technology. It's one if it could be fully, fully automated. And you can see here in the column, this justification by GPT. That means we requested the model to actually for each score generate a little text box that tells us why it thinks that is the uh, score that it should get. So we check the consistency of that and you can see like, for example, preparing daily lesson plans for, for primary school teachers, it thinks it can be helpful, but of course it, it says the human expertise or an understanding of the context is still needed, but it can help. So it gives a score of 0 0.6. When it comes to maintaining the discipline and good habits in the classroom, it basically thinks it's useless. It's 0 0.5, so very low score. And we observe it across the range. So we rely on those scores. Once you have this huge matrix of these predictions, then you move into statistical methods of basically doing something with the data. And as the first thing, what we did is we took those tasks that got a high potential automation score, so above 0 0.8. And there is a way to use this type of AI to represent text as a mathematical notation, as a vector. So we vectorize all the text, all the tasks in the selection, and then we cluster them. So you can use a machine learning model to see how do these things cluster? What is the semantic similarity across those different tasks that got a high automated score? And you can see it's administration and communication tasks, customer service and coordination, providing information, responding to inquiries, processing language and data management and record keeping. So if you played around with those tools, you can see that this is really the type of capacity they have. And then that's what we're getting when we look at the typical task that it, it, we also look at potential of automation. So the next thing we can do is we can take those tasks <laughs> and this individual scores, take the occupational groups, then broad occupational groups that are here on the vertical axis and assign among all tasks that clerical supporters, support workers do, uh, what is the share of tasks with really high level exposure to automation and mid level? So we put some ranges onto those and high level, you can see that clerical support workers really stand out. A quarter of their tasks is in this high potential automation range and another almost 60% is in the medium range. And there's no other occupational group that really matches that. But that's followed by technicians, professionals, service and sales workers. So what it tells us is that you have that shift from what we had seen in the studies from the past about AI being used with machines and affecting mostly routine tasks, blue collar work, to the shift of white collar work, office type of tasks and occupations that for a long time were considered to be somewhat protected from automation with algorithms because it had a lot of cognitive tasks. But these cognitive tasks can increasingly be performed with this technology. Here's a distribution of how these tasks distribute within each occupation. So we did that for every occupation. And you can see again on the left, we have managers, and on the right, we have the clinical support workers. And while among the managers, like the density of these task scores is really to the left. Most of them are not easy to automate with this technology. Among clerical support workers, you have many jobs where the density of individual task scores is really to the right, like higher potential for automation. So the next thing that we do is we come up with a conceptual framework. If we have all these occupations and all these tasks, can we somewhat classify them and can we go for two extremes? And that's what we did. So you have on the horizontal axis here the, the overall score for every occupation based on these individual task level scores. And you have the standard deviation on the vertical. So those are like two parameters that we look at and we say, okay, if there's an occupation represented here by those red triangles, which has a high overall score, so the mean of these individual tasks is high, 
and there's very little variation among those scores, then that occupation has most of the tasks that could in theory be done with technology. So that, that occupation will have a high automation potential. What is the other extreme? Well, the other extreme are the occupations that don't have a very high overall score, but there's a lot of variation to the individual scores within those tasks. So they will have some tasks that go really high in this course, and that kind of a task could be performed with the technology, whereas for others, really, that human role is very central. And it's important to, to highlight here that this is the share of potential uh, exposure. So this is potential exposure. So we're ignoring factors like their relative cost of labor to the cost of this technology technological feasibility, actually access to the infrastructure, digital skills, and so on. He's saying, what's the top threshold? What is the maximum that you could do with this technology if you didn't have to think about these things? And what we do here is we basically take the microdata from the ILO's repository of microdata. So we have about 80 countries that report at a very detailed level, and then 140 and 160 countries at less detailed level. But we use like an econometric method of estimation to build a global model so we can find out how many such jobs there are in those categories. And we focus again on those two extremes. So if you're looking at those two plots, <clears throat> they're in the same scale. So some things stand out. On top, you have this augmentation potential. You can see when you look across income groups, they're quite similar. Okay, among low-income countries, it's a bit lower, but you're still between 10 to 14% of total employment. The bars blue in blue and orange represent male and female share of total employment, and they are quite equal except for the low middle income. There's not so much difference. And if you compare the top plot to the bottom plot, there are just many more such jobs. So we can see in the big picture, there are more jobs that could be transformed or augmented to this technology than those jobs that are directly exposed I mean, to, to the risk of automation. But when we look at the bottom part and this automation potential, what you can see is that it grows really fast with income in a basically linear way. So the wealthier the country, the higher the share of employment in that category. And also the bars, the orange bars, which is the female share of employment, grow also faster with income. So the higher the income of the country, the higher the share of female employment exposed to the risk of automation. So you have some indications immediately like for policy recommendations. Basically, that's what you don't want to happen. These are the jobs, the negative effects that you would want to prevent or mitigate and then maximize the top part, which is possibly a productive transition that could take away some of the tasks that are routine and create more space in an ideal world uh, for, for, for other type of work. We don't account in this study for the jobs that will be created. So we're just looking at what exists and the technology that exists already on the market and how deploying that technology would affect those jobs. And we have to keep in mind that there's another 9.1% of jobs that we left between those two extremes. We call it the big unknown. And these are jobs that could go either way, depending on what happens with the technology, how the policies go, how the deployment goes to the markets and so on. And just two final slides to show you that we've been going more in depth with this work. So we just finished the presentation at the World Bank. We're finalizing now a detailed study on Latin America with them, where we started producing country level estimates for Latin American countries. There are 22 countries that we have in the database. And we calculate this total exposure of, of employment. And we go also much more in depth on the basis of the microdata that we get. So we take individual responses in the microdata and we try to understand who are those people that could be affected in this case by this automation potential. And here you can see the reconfirmation of that, but with many more parameters. And I, I think it's that's, that's something that I found quite striking when, when we decompose the data. So you can see, okay, female, male employment, their shares of employment, exposed to potential automation are much higher among women held jobs in male employment. But you also have many more such jobs in rural areas, younger people, uh, more educated people, people who are in households with higher income, so non-poor households, and basically jobs that that, that exposure growth grows with the income. 
of, of the household. Jobs that are formal are much more exposed. And when it comes to this exposure to automation potential, these are salaried employees. So you have the profile of urban, highly uh, more educated, young, female, non poor, formal, salaried employee that's most exposed to basically possibly being automated. And in terms of sectors, we're looking at banking, finance, insurance, professional services, as well as public administration. So that's, we, we have so much of the stuff that we could talk about it for another three hours, but I'll spare you that. And with this, I hand over to Janine. Thank you. So thank you very much. So I'm gonna switch a little bit more just to discuss a little bit how, how the AI could potentially affect um, the quality of jobs when it's actually integrated into the workplace. So in the literature, it's discussed as augmented, which sounds very positive. And there are, of course, examples of positive use technology, such as what we did in our in our study. It was definitely, you know, we used the technology, it helped our research, it was great. But of course, that's not always the case when the AI is being adopted into the workplace. Um, so we, yeah, kind of link, starting to really formulate a little bit of a, of a policy view on, on, on this discussion. So, at the level of the technology, you can automate tasks that the worker is doing, or the technology can also automate tasks that replace managerial. So that's usually what's referred to in the literature as algorithmic management. Uh, both of these can affect job quality. Obviously, if you are the clerical support worker, whose a lot of their tasks are routine and it can be uh, automated, then there's going to be a, a general quantity effect. But even when you think about uh, low-level managerial positions, if there is you know, new scheduling software or other types of different uh, algorithmic systems being put into place, that could also have an impact on, on the employment of those workers. But then, of course, there's effects on job quality, and the managerial uh, automation has very important impacts on, on job quality. So it's useful when you're thinking about AI and the world of work to think of it kind of as a, as a life cycle or as a work life cycle. Uh, we know that AI is being used heavily in recruitment. Uh, so people, uh, algorithms decide, you know, who, who gets exposure to certain job vacancies and that affects then who applies for jobs. Uh, the software is being used particularly in the states heavily used in, in lower wage retail occupations where people are being screened and having different games and looking at social media accounts. A, lo a lot of the software is being used to, 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 um, to sift through candidates and to potentially help in the recruitment process. So that's one area. And then on the job, there's the impacts of, of how, that, how that technology affects the person's day-to-day -day work. Uh, and then, of course, there's the possibility to ensure this technology to be used for dismissal. So when we think of the platform economy, such as, you know, if you think of somebody, uh, a company such as uh, you know, transport network companies, the Ubers, the Lyfts, they, they're, they're the epitome of this type of use because the AI technology is focused, is being used for the recruitment, for task allocation, and all of the uh, nudging and so forth being done while they're, while they're performing their work, and also if they are potentially, you know, if they're not performing, if they have poor ratings, that could actually lead to being blocked in the platform in the platform of being dismissal. So that's the that's the, the top case, but of course, uh, other sectors, other occupations um, are being affected with, with some sort of the technology at different stages of the work life cycle. It just really depends on what occupation or industry you're in. Um, so this is uh, uh, evidence from a study that was done by some researchers at Cornell, Virginia Dolgast and, and colleagues on the use of AI in different contact centers or call centers in the US, Canada and Germany uh, and how it's affecting the quality of work. Um, so this is an example really of how it affects the automating their tasks, right? Um, well, you see the implementation of some of these AI systems, or sometimes it's not even AI, it's just really auto automated systems that, that dictate the, the flow of work or even that, um, that shrink the autonomy of the worker in responding to the customers who are calling. So this is a quote from one of the workers. Every call has a wizard flow that they require you to follow. It's horribly set up with incorrect and inefficient wizard flows. I have so many calls that I could fix the problem my ability to modify equipment or processes. 
So here, you know, a, a worker who's frustrated because they've been de-skilled. And of course, the repercussions for that are that when the customer finally gets to talk to the, the human, uh, a lot of times they're very frustrated if the prompts haven't been working well. I think we've probably experienced that. Um, and, and so we've seen this scale. So of the of the workers that they surveyed in different firms that were either not using AI or they had low, medium, or high intensity of AI use, the from a scale of one to five, a customer mistreatment, there was a perfect correlation with more AI and, and, and higher incidence of, of customer mistreatment. So it's just really a reflection of, you know, the, the technology can be great. There's a lot of really wonderful and potential uses, but there's also uses where it, it doesn't work so well. Um, and we need to keep those in mind because they have a consequence for job quality. Um, the technology can also be used, as I mentioned, for, for automating tasks, for automating man managerial tasks, so such as scheduling software. Um, this is a quote here from... Um, manager at, at, at Ann Taylor. This has appeared many years ago. This is also not AI. This is really just more of an algorithm, a, a scheduling software that was used to, to, to delegate the shifts for retail employees in the company. And the manager saying, well, Atlas gives personality to the system so that the employees hate the system and not us. So it, it's this way of putting a system with the, with the staff and, and blocking that, that human contact and managerial contact, which, which can lead to a lot of frustration. Uh, so we know that you know it's increasingly being used for task assignment, for monitoring workers, especially with the incidents of growing the use of remote work. It's been used for uh, people monitoring people's keystrokes to make sure they're online, taking random screenshots of workers, um, even just following just the data analytics in many of the of the software systems that are incorporated into workplaces. It can that can monitor what you're doing and sometimes can follow things saying, you know, maybe you need to respond to that email, or maybe you need to do this and that. I mean, there's, so all of that affects people, and, you know, it coaches them, it nudges them. And of course, it has, it can have consequences for evaluation if that, if that, if those data analytics are being taken into account to evaluate uh, worker performance. Okay, so switching now to, to kind of more the policy side and what we've been discussing at the ILO. Um, so in our numbers, we we don't find that it's going to be a jobs apocalypse. So that in itself is a very good thing. But nevertheless, uh, we do have this number of, you know, in high income countries, 5.1% of employment is potentially exposed. It doesn't mean it's all going to disappear, but potentially exposed. And of course, uh, unemployment is a very personal issue with, you know, very significant ramifications for that individual and their family. Important scarring effects in the labor market, but also important on social, social effects. So one of the things that we we advocate for, we have an employment protection convention number 158, which really argues for the use of social dialogue in prioritizing redeployment and training over job loss. So if you think of a call center within a company that might become fully automated or, or maybe not fully, but a lot of people might lose their jobs, the need to then redeploy those workers into other positions in the organization if there's if there's the, the ability to do so. When there isn't the ability to do so, the need to not just have um, training um, policies put into place, but also to have income support. And this is particularly something we say for, you know, we obviously a global organization. We have many countries where there isn't unemployment insurance and people don't have access to income support. And then if you think, well, we, people are going to get trained. If they don't have income support during the training, they tend to not participate in training programs and and there could be negative effects where they turn to food vending or other or other means of earning a living that aren't the best for, for the economy or for that individual. Uh, and then the need to really invest in sectors that we know that there is really the potential of good quality job creation and where there are important shortages. So all over the world, we have shortages in the care economy. Uh, in long-term care, we have shortages of midwives, doctors, nurses, and this is something that's 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 a global phenomenon. And and these can be sources of good quality jobs. So yes, maybe some of these jobs might use the AI, but you're not going to be replacing nurses and with with full AI systems. So this is a potential for 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 job creation for those those countries that might be more effective, particularly those who have invested heavily in developing their business process outsourcing sector, which is a sector that's more exposed to. Um, so when it comes to the job quality effects, we know from the data that six times as many jobs are potentially going to be more transformed by this occupation rather than, than automated. And so we need governance to ensure that the transformation is positive. So we've kind of... Uh, designated this kind of system, we need cer certain red lines and prohibitions of certain practices, and then to what extent can there be the use of bargaining or at least um, 
participatory design in in developing technological systems that are beneficial for, for, for job quality. So first, just to talk about uh, some of the red lines, um, there does need to be some sort of regulation that that prohibits uh, that prohibits the infringement of, of fundamental workers' rights. Um, so this could be discrimination or this could be freedom of association. Uh, you don't want to have a situation where employees' conversations with their worker representatives are being monitored. That's not something that should be allowed. Um, or even if people who are considering unionizing, if they're having these conversations and these conversations have been monitored, that's an really important risk for freedom of association. You also want to prohibit employer monitoring in particular contexts outside of the workplace, either temporarily or, or geographically. Uh, this is particularly important now with the growth of remote work and people who have been monitored working at home that they not be monitored off hours or out, outside the specific context of their of their work site. Um, and then in in places where it poses dignity. Um, risks to human dignity, such as bathrooms. And I think we can discuss that one. That one's clear. Um, and the other issue is the prohibition of algorithmic dismissal, that people need to have some sort of human that, that takes that final decision and that there be human abilities for, for redress. Uh, in the platform economy, there have been situations, people who are blocked, then they can't get on the app. And because they can't get on the app, they don't have anybody to talk to. So, that, so, so there's real concerns there. Um, so... One issue, and, and this is kind of the experience of, of Nordic countries. If you look at if you look at statistics on fears of technology, and you look at the Nordic countries, um, the fear of technology is much less, and that's because of you know high levels of of of, of, of freedom of association, collective bargaining, and and worker participation in the integration of of technological systems at the workplace. Um, so the idea that when new systems are being integrated in the workplace, to the extent possible, that workers be involved in the design of these systems. And I think that the customer, the contact center um, is, is a perfect example. If you had the if you had those contact center workers involved in how those that wizard flow was being integrated, you would have had a wizard flow that worked a lot better. Uh, so that's just kind of overall uh, important um, uh, important role to role to follow. Of course, this is more, more easily done if workers have job security. So in an employment at will workplace, it's, it becomes very difficult for people to speak up if they're not happy with the technological system. And it's best done when, when workplaces are, are unionized. That gives really the, 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 the best scope. So there, there needs to be collective bargaining um, that can so collective bargaining is a really useful tool for the integration of, of, of technology because when you have just at the regulatory or statutory level, you can address some of these more um, egregious practices, but it's very difficult to, to address things as such as workplace design that could affect job quality. Whereas collective bargaining gives you a scope to do that because you could have a union negotiating over how the technology is integrated. And in that paper, actually, on the customer, um, the call center workers, in Germany, uh, there was the example of Deutsche Telekom, which, which had a technological integration. The work councils were involved with the integration of the technology in the workplace, and this led to much more favorable favorable outcomes. Um, so we're seeing AI being increasingly uh, a, a source of negotiation in collective bargaining agreements, but it tends to be more, I mean, you, we've obviously, we saw that with sag after last year in the U.S., um, but obviously the, most of the examples are coming out of Europe where, where collective bargaining is, is much higher. Um, we also note that many social partners are unprepared to negotiate over these issues and the importance really of training on these technological topics for, for social partners so that they're really in a position to bargain over them. Um, and then, of course, the other area of concern is that you have low levels of immunization that, that would impede that the possibility for this to happen. Um, the other thing, the important thing to keep in mind is with the discussion on augmentation and productivity benefits, I mean, there is possible that there will be important productivity benefits. We want to make sure that there's a sharing of the gains. So if worker becomes more productive and or if they don't have to do that routine, routine tasks, are they just getting more work? Um, or could that maybe lead to a reduction of working hours? Or are they, if they're so much more productive, do they get a benefit of, of what are the, some of the, the, the wage increases? And so here, the, just to reiterate the importance of strong labor market institutions um, in, in this process, because if you don't have that, then those productivity gains won't be shared. And the well-known chart in the United States of the, of the decoupling between productivity growth and wage growth in the United States. 
And just a, a final note, um, as far as, you know, so our numbers don't consider new jobs that will be created. We know that one area where there has been a lot of strong job creation related to AI is for people who are training the AI system. So there's this belief that all AI is magic, but there's actually been millions and millions and millions of humans that have 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 uh, labeled and trained AI systems and continue to do so and will continue to do so in the future. Um, many of these workers are in the global south. A lot of them work through crowdsourcing platforms. Sometimes they work through BPOs. But we know that the the, the working conditions tend to not all of them, but in, in some in instances, they, they are working as independent contractors, so they don't have the benefits and rights of an employment relationship or, or their earning pay. Okay. So this is an opportunity really to create these jobs as good jobs to replace some of the, the jobs that might be lost. And next year at the ILO, we'll be having a standard setting discussion on decent work platform economy and hopefully the, this this um this discussion of of crowd surf, crowd workers or online digital platform workers will be will receive attention because this is an important area of job growth in the future. So thank you very much. You can stay up to date with the latest news about workers, worker power and unions by subscribing to the Power at Work blog. You'll receive the weekly download, a Power at Work newsletter sent straight to your inbox. The weekly download collects about two dozen of the week's articles, academic studies, press releases, podcasts, and videos from across the internet. We find the stories and deliver them directly to you. So subscribe to the weekly download right now on the front page of the Power at Work blog. Go to poweratwork.us. Great, so thanks so much. That's a great overview of the research. I think now we can open the floor up for any questions, comments, and also to our colleagues connecting online, just to remind you that you can use the chat, chat function as well. And go ahead. This was wonderful. So many questions one could ask, but I've been looking a little bit about retirement and age, and I know things are evolving. What are you seeing as a consequence of AI in terms of older people remaining in the workforce? Of course, it will vary by sector, but this might give an opportunity to people who would otherwise retire because of physical demands that AI might obviate or being overwhelmed by some cognitive task that can be pushed over to AI. So I'm wondering what you're seeing, if you are seeing the impact on aging and retirement. Okay, so we haven't looked specifically at, at that issue in the Latin American study where we did actually the breakdown by demographics. We see that the workers that are more likely to be affected are more younger workers because it tends to be, at least we're talking really more about generative AI, it tends to be the entry level type jobs that are the potential to be automated. So if you think of like of the legal profession, it would be the, you know, the, let's see, the, the the junior lawyers that are doing the due diligence, that could be then automated uh, and not so much the work of, 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 um, of, of workers that have more seniority. So th that's one issue. There is, um, in the kind of the AI literature in general, there is discussion about how AI can be used to improve safety and health at work. Um, so that's one benefit that it could have for, for, for older workers. There is, of course, also the risk of that sometimes older workers have let, there are less adept technological systems. And so if they're then required to use the technological systems and they, they can't use them as well, that could be also. Good. AI adapts. And so some of the technology constraints can be lessened with another level. Potentially, potentially. When computers entered the workplace in the 80s, 90s, there was a lot of talk about jobs being eliminated, jobs being changed. <clears throat> how is the discussion about, how is AI's discussion now different from or similar to discussion of computerization uh, 20, 30 years ago? Right. Um, so, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And in fact, at the ILO, there was even a, a committee on computerization. There was a lot of fears back then of, of, of jobs apocalypse, just like there is today. And it didn't, it didn't happen. Happen. And I and I think we need to keep that in mind because when we there is so much discussion where it talks about how yeah all the jobs are going to disappear, we know um, for example the the take up so far of AI is 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 pretty low. So there was a survey done in the U.S. in 2019 of enterprises, and something 
thirteen percent had actually adopted AI into their systems, and, and the rest hadn't, uh, and it tended to be the larger, the larger companies. So the there, there's issues about cost of adoption. There's issues about technology, and there's also limitations. So maybe in theory, and some of these um, analyses that are done, yes, maybe in theory it could be replaced by a computer, but when then you put it practice, it doesn't work. So yeah, I think I mean it, it's hard to know. It, you know we're big fans of crystal balls and on. but but I think it does keep give pause to some of the the headline figures that you see in the newspaper about you know 50 percent of the jobs are going to disappear do you want to add to that yeah. well, maybe I mean I think that's where studies that use task based approaches and the more that we can get there become interesting because you you see these headline figures of how many jobs could be automated but when you actually go into what a given occupation does on a daily basis, and you try to imagine, could you do it with that technology? Then you get the picture that we're getting here in the statistics. How many yeah. jobs are there actually? Where are people employed? And that changes also a lot with the structure of the economy. So it's very different in high-income economies. And in low-income economies, as we could see that in, in, in these statistics. But I mean, in some way, Computers changed a lot, uh, the labor markets and, and the type of occupations. But what actually matters is that net effect at the end of it. And there was the very strong effect as well with the creation of new jobs and new tasks. So clearly, I mean, even if you ask around, actually, our colleagues at the ALO, uh, we have colleagues who told us, well, in the 80s or before computers were introduced, person would have two assistants for typing letters and communication and so on. These jobs are clearly gone. Typists are gone. And people were given their own computer. And they had to type. And for many of them, that was a bit of a shock. And then others had to <laughs> learn. So it's not the same jobs that are around. And there's a famous study from David Otter who says that he measures that is it 60% of jobs that existed in the beginning of the year of 2000 in the US did not exist in the 1940s. So that's the scale of turnaround. You have these new jobs coming up and this technology will also bring new jobs for sure. Uh, it's just a question of what type of jobs there are and, and how these tasks evolve. And that's, that's what we try to understand, but it's really hard to predict. And the flip side of that is that we didn't see the productivity increases that we thought we were going to see. Right. Right? Uh, Gordon from Chicago writes about he had this you know, 100 years of productivity growth and then it sort of flattened out. And, it, and computers didn't dramatically change the, uh, our productivity. But uh, I, I'm interested on your, your take on which jobs will be affected. Because it seems to me like the, the, the jobs that are most vulnerable to being eliminated are the managerial jobs. You know, having worked in a factory, for the most part, managers are redundant. Uh, they, 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 <laughs> workers know how to produce things. Yeah. So in, in, the, in the collective bargaining context, if unions are at the table representing their members, getting rid of management might be a good thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, what do you think about that? You know, I mean, I think I think there is that risk, especially with a lot of the technology that can be replacing managerial functions. Um, I think there's limits to that, though. I mean, I think there is there is something important about having a human in the loop and having somebody you can go down the hall to or, or call on the phone and talk to if you have a problem that you need to resolve. Um, and and there's limits there with the, with the with the systems on how much they could do that. Um, when we when we look at the four digit codes with the managers, it's also some functions like if you, one of them, for example, restaurant managers. So yes. Some things in restaurants, and you already see this today with, with reservations and even now ordering and paying have become automated. Um, but it's very hard to ensure that the tables are clean and everything is set if, you know, the AI is not going to be able to do that. So you do need some humans there. So I think they're they're not going to be fully, my, my sense is that not, they can't be fully automated, but maybe fewer, fewer of them. Janine is my manager, so I <laughs> 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 well, <laughs> But uh, no, the, the jobs that we were looking at and the, the, where we see this big difference is really this clerical jobs. And that's a type of work that is typical office work, what you think about as 
office assistance, administrative work, and these tasks where this kind of tools, either in their current capacity or in extended applications, can perform very well. For example, drafting official communication. It's a little bit of an extension of the story of typists in the past. They came a technology that was just doing it much better, and you could correct text on the computer, and so on. you don't have to retype it. And now you have a technology that can draft letters and invitations and communication. So if some, well, if there are occupations that, and there are occupations that flew that as uh, as the core, uh, then they are most exposed occupations that deal with, for example, booking of travel. Uh, in a professional context, we have a lot of things like that and different administrative procedures. These tools shorten the communication path between the human and the machine, and they can work as independent agents eventually. So you can link them to technologies that, for example, well, booking like sites already did that. They eliminated a lot of agents, but you still have, they just push the work onto the user. You're actually doing that, that work when you're booking it. But now, if you think of an agent that can have authorization and eventually be built in a way that you just talk to it, then there will be more jobs that were doing that intermediary function. So that's why these clerical jobs is what we found to be most exposed because the share of tasks of this type that in theory could be performed with this technology is just much higher than among any other occupation. I'm from a Nordic country and I agree with your description there about it's also a culture of mm -hmm. kind of scarcity of workers, kind of, because it's like countries up in the north with small populations and having to make do with human resources that you've got. You don't have the to speak language and so on. And so you need to involve everybody and make sure everybody's busy and productive because you only have the workers you have. You cannot import them. In India, you cannot. You simply can't. And, and that is the culture. And then that translates into the methodology in the workplace and helps um, keep this um, unionized approach and so on because it's kind of, it's not solidarity because we're good people, it's because there's no other way in the face of scarce resources and long, long cold winters, basically. Right? So, um, but we have another problem, I think. I don't know if you have a comment on that, but I think for a long time, at least in the public sector in my country, Sweden, we've been keeping budgets constantly lower and lower like very sort of keep cutting positions all the time and middle management a long time back and in anticipation of further uh technological change right so it's kind of like we've been preparing for ai for over 20 years which of course in many ways is a good thing so that's why we're not so scared because we feel like yeah yeah we knew this was coming we didn't know exactly this was coming we just knew stuff was coming so that's a good part. But then we look at in the care sector, because I really want to pick up your point on investing in those under uh, resourced. resourced and because we have that problem, right? So, and that's linked to taxes because you cannot tax an algorithm, right? So then that's the problem that you, it becomes too costly to put people into the other sectors, right? So, so I think the problem for us would be around taxing this new economy. Okay, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I can start. I can start. Okay. Yeah, I, I, yeah, so there is a discussion that is emerging, I think, in the, in the context of high income economies, and especially Darla Smogl, whom we will actually interview as part of, yeah. in June, of a series of webinars that we're doing with ITU on the uh, impact of AI on labor markets, has been writing about that, that in many countries, the incentive is set in such a way that it's just um, tax-wise to substitute labor for technology. So uh, we haven't studied that in depth in order to sort of give you our take on that, but obviously the system of incentives and how it influences, uh, it does matter. But I, I, I don't yeah. know. I mean, so the argument is to have, how can you re-change re the tax system so you have a, a, a more positive benefits from the AI? But then it's very difficult because do you, there, as it is, governments already are very hesitant to have any regulation on AI because there's this concern that if we regulate AI, we won't be innovative. 
And so if you start saying you're going to tax the robots or tax the algorithms, there's going to be, it's going to be very difficult. So, but I, I agree with you. I mean, I think there, there is a, we, we need jobs in these other sectors. If they are funded by the public sector, then how do you finance them? Especially if you're, if you're in a situation of job loss. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have a good answer to it, but, 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 yeah, but I, yeah, I agree with you. I got a question first. Did you have, did you have oh, yeah, you did. Um, I should ask her, but I just was curious <laughs> what specific like provisions, like an example of like a European or Nordic Union, you know, you're saying they're bargaining about the effects of this, or it sounds like they're already preparing or have been preparing. Right. They're already memorable. Well, I can give you the examples from the Deutsche Telekom. Um, so the Deutsche Telekom. The one thing they had, okay, they integrated the technology. The works councils have to be informed anytime the technology is being put into place, and there has to be a discussion about the technology. Uh, they also agreed in the collective bargaining that uh, there was use of outsourced workers for some of the contact center work. So those were the workers that were dismissed, and they kept, and there was an agreement to keep all the people uh, in the company on, in their jobs and just re reallocate them. Rather than, rather than um, but the, I think the, the probably more important thing is really about well that, that's very important. But the other important thing is really the involvement of the workers about how these AI systems are implemented. Um, yeah, I would agree with that. And looking at it from like an order perspective, there's this long-standing tradition of empowering the worker. I mean, it kind of comes already through the education system where you kind of teach everyone to responsible in terms of their own development and stuff it's less of a hierarchy or military thing where the teacher has all the answers it's more it, it's not perfect and it has many disadvantages too but just in general give the idea how you can do it. not expected kids to just obey the adults that's allowed to ask critical questions or suggest other solutions to how stuff should be done, right? And then that carries into the workplace. And then there's this culture where both on the side of the workers and on the side of like managers and management to constantly involve um you know everybody and, and kind of be have group being powered all the time. So then when there's new technology it just follows that pattern. So it's, I think I would say the German tradition is maybe a little more formalistic mm -hmm. but I think they have legislation about who should be informed and where we don't have that. So we only have, we don't legislate this kind of thing at all. It's it's just, we have a method. It's it's based on uh, sectoral agreements, tripartite sectoral agreements that are being renegotiated every three years. And then this will just go into that. So it's kind of like a constant social dialogue where you just feed in the new stuff that's happening into a loop. It can sometimes produce conflict and lots of anger and even strikes, but it's pretty rare because everybody wait for the next one. Yeah. Of study circles. <laughs> but it seemed like, you know, both as, as a potential for being remarkably dehumanizing. Already, I feel like uh, I don't dominate systems, they dominate me, and I have to run through the rat maze. But then I wonder, too, on the flip side, like what. What are the model provisions? Maybe we need to ask AI, because um, this is going to be a rapidly <laughs> uh, I'd like to see what, what does this look like? What does a collective model look like? And it's, there's not going to be one answer. There's going to be multiple. You know, there's going to be a lot of testing the waters out. So I'll, I'll be curious to see if somebody's collecting information. Yeah, there, there, there are people who are collecting information. Um, uh, I have to find the link, but there's been a, a kind of a repository put together of collective bargaining agreements on, on digitalization. And, and AI. And where is that? Or where? Um, it was. It's being funded. I thought it was being funded by PSI, Public Services International, and working with a few consultants, and they've been putting that together. So yeah, there's a, and there have been some academic studies on how collective bargaining agreements have been, are being used. The each the European Trade Union uh, Institute has a journal called Transfer, and they put out a special issue on collective bargaining agreements around technology. So, so yeah, there, there is, it's definitely, there's a lot of information out there. Well, that was really something, wasn't it? I, I hope you learned a good bit about generative AI and got an answer to your question about what will the effect of generative AI be on jobs and worker power. 
Um, I thought it was a fascinating conversation, and we want to extend our deepest gratitude to the ILO and to Janine Berg and to Pavel Gamirik for sharing this webinar with us, for allowing us to publish it to you uh, and to put it out into the, the ether, into the atmosphere, so that folks can take a look at it and learn from it. I, I think it's a really valuable uh, piece of information. We are eager to hear your comments about this event. You can add your comments at the bottom of the page on which on the Power at Work blog on which you found this blogcast or podcast. You could just give us a thumbs up or you can give us your reaction. What did you like? What didn't you like? What did you agree with? What did you not agree with? Start the conversation with other members of the Power at Work community. You can also connect with the Power at Work team in a lot of different ways on social media. We have pages on LinkedIn and Facebook. Just search Power at Work blog. You can find us at Power at Work blog on Twitter X and threads. You can find us at Power at Work on Instagram, TikTok, and Patreon as well. You can find all of our blogcasts on the, on the blog itself. If you go to the Power at Work blog front, front page and click on Blogcasts, you'll find all of our blogcasts there. But you can also find them, if you're a YouTube user, on YouTube. Go to the Burns Center for Social Change channel. All of our blogcasts are there as well. Hey, thanks again for joining us for this very special uh, Power at Work blogcast and podcast. We will see you again on the blog very, very soon. The Power at Work blog is a project of the Byrne Center for Social Change at Northeastern University. The Byrne Center develops innovative, participatory, and equitable approaches to solving public problems using new technology. Our faculty and fellows are accomplished, nationally recognized change makers. Interested in learning more? Go to burns.northeastern.edu and sign up for our mailing list. And you can follow us on social media at Byrne Center on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. The Burns Center for Social Change, from demanding change to making it.